Hey there, Roamers. Welcome to the Roam in Your Home podcast and YouTube channel, where we get to hear from full-time RVers, unpack their experiences, and learn actionable advice to help you roam in your home too. I'm your host, Jamie Williams. Thank you so much for being here. Buckle up, my friend. Let's get ready to go on an adventure together right now. Hey friends, it's Jamie, and I'm so glad you're here. Today's April 3rd, 2024, and you are listening to episode number eight. If it's your first time listening, welcome. My husband Randy and I have been full-time RVers since 2017, and the goal of this podcast is to give people a glimpse of RV life and hear from real full-time RVers that are living the dream. We pull back the curtain and ask all the questions and get all the answers of what we wish we knew before we started full-time RVing. My goal is to share these real life conversations with you each week so that you can get the information that you need to be able to roam in your home too. Today, I am so excited to share my conversation with Chris and Gary from Big Dog RV. I am a huge dog lover and have been a big fan of theirs for a while now, and it was so much fun getting to know them and hearing all about their dogs. They shared a ton of very valuable information, and I learned a lot from them. I decided to split this conversation into two parts, so you are listening to part one and next week come back for part two so i won't make you wait any longer please help me give a warm welcome to chris and gary hi chris and gary welcome to the show hi jamie thanks for having us thank you so much for being here i am super excited to have you guys here i have loved following your adventures on instagram i am a huge dog lover so when i saw your instagram page at big dog rv i was all about it i just love your dogs i'm really excited to talk more about your adventures and get to know you guys better and for our listeners to hear more about your experiences so thanks for being here absolutely we love to hear that because we love to talk about our dogs and we love to talk about our adventures. Oh, perfect. So I always like to find out before we begin, how long have you guys been on the road? So we actually bought our current rig in 2018 and we just traveled occasionally kind of getting ready for full-time life and we took off uh, for full-time life in November of 2020. Wow. So we're actually in our fourth year of full-time now. Oh my goodness. That's incredible. Now, has it went by fast or uh, does it feel like it's a lot. It has flown by. It is unbelievable how fast it has gone by because when you're thinking about doing this, you don't know if you're really going to like it. Is it a lifestyle that you can get used to? Is it something you're going to like? You know, we didn't know if we were going to enjoy being on the road full time. And we probably every few months or so, we talk to each other and we say, is this something we really like? And overwhelmingly, we can't see an end in sight at this point. Oh, we agree. Yes. When we started actually in 2017, we bought our rig and we didn't know if we would like it or not. And yeah, we feel the same way. Like we cannot imagine not doing this now. Exactly. You know, everybody keeps asking us when we're going to stop. And it's like, we have no idea when we're going to stop because this is so much fun. Exactly. (laughs) Oh, I'm so glad you guys are loving it too. Now, when you bought your first rig in 2018, was that like your first RV ever? Like you've never had any experience RVing prior to that? So we had a pop-up when uh, we have daughters uh, that were born in the the late 90s. They're in their upper 20s now. And they grew up with us going boondocking out in the National Forest in a pop-up. So we had pop-up experience and that was it. And we sold our pop-up and went into our current rig at that point. Oh, that's so great, though, that you guys had that experience with your kids. Because Randy and I both grew up without any experience of camping with our families or anything. And when we decided to do this, It was so new to us and everybody thought we were crazy. But now that we love it so much, we always think about, oh, I wish we could have grown up like this because all the memories you made with your girls are just priceless. They absolutely are. Uh, so what made you guys decide to do this RV life full time? So it's kind of a long story. More than 20 years before we bought our motor home, we met an older couple. They were in the process of selling all of their belongings that they owned and they had just purchased their motor home. And I remember looking across the street from their house and seeing the motor home sitting there, knowing that the next day they were going to get in that motor home and drive away from everything they'd always had. And at the time I thought wow that's dramatic but I looked at my husband I looked at Gary and I remember thinking that would be so cool to do but 
how do you get your spouse on board? And I looked at him and he was looking at me with this look in his eyes that told me that he thought that was a really cool adventure also. So I think I knew more than 20 years before we did this that we were going to end up on the road someday. We lived in the time just south of Erie, Pennsylvania, and that's Lake Erie in the Great Lakes District. And we regularly got around 120 inches of snow every year. It was a huge, almost daily chore in the winter to move that snow around. We knew we wanted to get away from that. We had a hobby farm with horses, miniature goats, miniature horses, miniature mules, chickens, ducks, turkeys. It was a hobby farm. We loved it. We loved our life. But the winters were brutal, and I personally hate cold. So I knew it was a great chapter of our lives that was going to end at some point when our daughters were grown and out of the house. So I would say that we knew long ago that we were going to do this someday. I don't know when the actual decision was that made us decide to do RV life full time, but I would say that that seed was planted a good 20 years before we started. Oh, you are so fortunate to actually have seen that and be interested in both of you guys on the same page. You know, this is something that I did not even ever consider. I, I, I remember probably, I don't know, 30 some years ago working as a secretary and talking to one of the clients that we had for the business. And he was saying that he was retiring and going to be selling everything and, you know, traveling across the country in a motorhome. And honestly, to be honest with you, at the time, I thought that was the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I never knew anybody could do that. <laughs> and I honestly was like, why would you, you know, thinking in my mind, I didn't say that to him, of course. I was like, oh, good luck to you. But I'm thinking, why would anybody <laughs> want to leave their stuff and leave all, you know, just travel? And here we are doing the same thing and absolutely loving it. So I wish I would have gotten that seed planted when he said that to me. And I wish, uh, yeah, I would have given it some more thought because we would have done this so much sooner. But that's awesome. That is so cool. So you just um, answered my next question. So you guys have a motorhome. And tell us a little bit about it. We do. <laughs> so we didn't know right away what we wanted. We knew that we were going to, we knew that Gary was going to be retiring in 2018 and that we were kind of coming closer to that time when we wanted to take off full time. We had no idea what we wanted. So we started shopping around. We knew that we wanted something big enough for the dogs. We had the dogs. Honestly, we got the dogs not thinking that we were going to live in a motorhome with them, but we had the dogs when we were ready to start shopping. So we needed something big enough for them. We went to RV dealers, RV shows. We looked at travel trailers, which we ruled out pretty quickly just because of the dogs. We looked at fifth wheels, motorhomes, and we were drawn to the motorhomes because I liked the idea of being able to get up and use the bathroom and use the kitchen, things like that, without getting out of the rig while we're traveling to do all those things. So I liked the idea of the motorhome. Somebody said to us several years ago that when you're in a fifth wheel or a trailer, the fun starts when you arrive at your destination. But when you're in a motorhome, the fun starts when you pull out of the driveway. And that hit close to me. I thought that was an interesting thought. And that's kind of how it's come to pass with us too. So we were drawn to motorhomes, although we gave fifth wheels a pretty good, um, a good test. We had the dogs in them and things like that, but we just kept coming back to a motorhome. So then the decision came to diesel versus gas. We had a Ford F-150 truck that we could already flat tow and the gassers would not have been able to tow a vehicle that big. It made sense to keep the truck because it was paid for and more importantly, the dogs fit in the back seat. So it made sense for us to keep it and find a rig that would tow it. So we did end up with a 40 foot uh, Tiffin diesel pusher. So we have a Tiffin Phaeton diesel that we fit in nicely. Oh, awesome. And you tow your F-150. Exactly. Yes. Okay. And then I need to know now talk about which I should have asked you first. Tell us about your awesome dogs. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, I want to know all about them. So we have two Great Danes. Before I retired, I was the executive director of a nonprofit animal rescue organization. I had been involved with the organization for over 20 years. It was very central to me. And in 2015, we had a Great Dane at the time who was just over a year old. 
and we were asked to foster another Great Dane that was only five months old. He was very unruly. The family had small children. He was playing and knocking them down, not meaning to knock the children down. He was just a 90-pound, five-month-old dog that they were having a hard time getting a grip on. I had done a lot of dog training, so I said, we will take this dog. We're going to put a month's worth of training into him. We're going to make him adoptable, and when he's six months old, we're going to adopt him out and basically save his life because they were looking at some some pretty extreme options for him at that point. We took him in. As I mentioned before, we had the hobby farm, so we had quite a bit of fenced-in acreage that we could get these dogs out and run them and play with them and train them. And what we discovered that we did not expect was that our first Great Dane, Tango, had never had a dog his size to play with. And they were both 90 pounds at the time, and they developed a bond within the first week. And it became very difficult to separate them after that time. So after a month, when we had the second dog, Murdoch, more under control and trained, we couldn't see separating the two dogs. So we kind of inadvertently brought this dog into our lives, meaning not to keep it, and ended up with him. So we ended up adopting the second Great Dane. So now we have Tango and Murdoch. They're both eight years old now and still just as bonded as ever. It's hard to walk one without taking the other. It really is. At that time, we also had another rescue that was just a little six pound mixed breed dog. She's got three legs. She was found in 2010. She was a year or so old at the time. So, you know, figure now she's around 15 years old at this point. She was another we hadn't intended to keep, but, you know, things happen and we did. And I can say that through the years we have fostered hundreds of dogs and these are the three that we ended up keeping. So I guess they were supposed to be part of us. So it's kind of funny when you see us walking down the, you know, through the campground or something, we've got a six pound dog on three legs. We have a 130-pound Great Dane and a 180-pound Great Dane. So we have over 300 pounds of dog between the two of us. <laughs> so we do stand out. Oh, my gosh. And Murdoch is the big one, right? He is. He's the big boy. Yeah, Murdoch grew to 180 pounds, which is bigger than we expected. When we had him at 90 pounds, we didn't know he was going to double. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love that story. I did not know the backstory to that. I cannot imagine the two not together. I thought you got them together together. I did not know. Oh my gosh, they are inseparable. They're so cute together. I just love them. Well, and what else is funny is that people will approach us now, you know, like I said, we're in our fourth year on the road and people will approach us and they will say, did we see you at this other campground that we had been at before? So people recognize the dogs. They don't recognize <laughs> us, but they recognize the dogs. And it's funny how often we run into that now. Oh, I love that. Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. I would go nuts seeing you in person because your dogs, <laughs> I'm like such a fan of them online. I can't wait to hopefully one day meet them in person. We would love that. Your little one is so adorable. Do they all get along really well? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, she doesn't like walking without her big brothers. And people ask me a lot, is she the one that's the boss? And she's really not. She's very mellow, laid back, introverted. She's not a yappy little dog. You know, she's pretty quiet and she doesn't want to go out for a walk without her big brothers nearby. I cannot walk outside, you know, away from the motorhome. If the motorhome's not in sight and I don't have her brothers, she won't go. She will only go for a walk if her big boys are right there next to her. Oh, I love that she feels that they're protecting her and I'm sure they are. I love that. I love seeing the pictures of, you know, your little girl and then the two big boys are just so cute together. They are. That's so much fun. And I've seen some of the things that you guys have done to make it comfortable for the Great Danes and it's just so perfect. You guys really do travel pretty comfortably in your big rig with the big dogs. We do. That's awesome. We need the big rig and we've done some modifications to make sure that they fit in it. Um, people are amazed that we can fit two Great Danes in the rig. But like I said, we bought absolutely a bigger motor home than we would have bought if we didn't have the dogs. And I don't know that we'll always be in a motorhome this size, but as long as we've got the dogs, it makes sense. One of the things that we did is that we bought a floor plan that has a booth dinette instead of chairs and a table. And we turned the booth dinette into a giant bed and we had a cushion custom made to fit in that spot. So they have their own raised dog bed because, you know, Great Danes don't want to lay on the floor. <laughs> so they have their own raised dog bed and that keeps them up and out of my way. 
and kind of tucked back into a corner. And that is really what makes this whole arrangement work. I saw that and it is genius. It's so perfect. They both fit on together so comfortably. They do. And you're right. It does get them out of the way. So they're not under your feet. Cause I'm sure when they're laying on the ground, you're on the floor that they take up a lot of that floor space. So I, it would be hard to walk around them. Yes. <laughs> right. Oh, that is so perfect. And now that you guys have been traveling for four years in your, you said four years, right? We are in our fourth year now. Yes. Fourth year. Okay. Just want to make sure I got that right. Now that you've been traveling in your motor home for four years, you know, there's so many times when people are shopping for RVs and they're comparing like you guys did, you know, the fifth wheel versus the motor home and all of this. And I always love to ask people now that they're actually living in their RV, things that they love and that they don't love about it. Cause you really don't know what you don't know. And it's, it really takes a little while to learn like, Oh, I'm so glad about this feature. And Oh, I wish this were a little bit different. So if you wouldn't mind sharing, what are three things that you love about your motorhome? Well, we did a lot of research ahead of time. Thank goodness. We actually researched for a couple of years before landing on this one. And I'm glad we did because what we like are the size and the floor plan. And we looked at larger and we looked at smaller and this is the size that works for us. So I would say the first thing that we love about it is the size and the floor plan. It's big enough to live in comfortably. The dogs and all of our stuff fits, but it's still, it's 40 foot. So it's bigger than some national parks can fit us, but there are more and more national parks that we can actually fit into. And there are a lot of state parks that we can still fit in. So it's small enough for that, but it's big enough for the dogs and us to live comfortably in. It has double sinks in the bathroom. It has large closets, lots of dresser storage. So I like all that, the size and the floor plan. Uh, in addition to that, we wanted something that we felt was a high enough quality that we could live in it long term because I didn't want to buy another one. It was kind of a stressful couple of years trying to figure out what we wanted. It was not something I wanted to go through again. So I want something that's going to last for the next 20 years. And so we like the Tiffin brand. They stand behind their product and we feel that it's pretty high quality. It's a 2014. So it was manufactured before there were some quality control issues. And we're really very happy with that. And then the last kind of a smaller thing that I like, and it's kind of controversial, I think, amongst people who do this full time, is that I really like my residential refrigerator and my washer and dryer, especially with the dogs. I like to be able to do laundry anywhere, anytime. And I don't have to look for a laundromat. <laughs> yes. So those are my big things that we really love about it. Oh, those are some really great points too. And yes, I know there's so much controversy on the res residential refrigerator or not. And we had the residential refrigerator. We don't now with our new rig. We went from a 40 foot fifth wheel to just a small 20 foot travel trailer just temporarily to do a bucket list adventure. And we are definitely ready to get back to a big rig. And so we totally miss the residential refrigerator. That is one thing that we are excited about getting back to. That's interesting. Yeah. And so now let's talk about a few things maybe that you don't like quite as much, or maybe you would change if you were given the opportunity. Okay. So the very first on the list is going to make you chuckle a little bit because the first thing that I dislike about it is its size, which is funny <laughs> because that was the first thing that I love about it is the size and that it fits us so comfortably. But sometimes it feels like it's too big. You know, when you're lumbering down the road, it just feels so big. It's like this big behemoth that you're trying to get down the road or you're trying to get into a, a state park, a national park, things like that. So sometimes, although the size fits us so well, sometimes it feels monstrous and it feels so big. So if we could size down, I think we might at some point, but right now the size fits us perfectly. Also, our fuel mileage is only around about eight and a half miles per gallon. So that's not great. We don't like that. And then last is that it's really kind of expensive to fix when something breaks. When you're in a motorhome this big uh, with the big diesel engine, you know, they say you can get a million miles out of a, a diesel engine if you maintain it properly. And we're very good about maintenance. But at the same time, if something does break, then it's pretty expensive to fix. So that's something that we're not crazy about. Yeah, that is what I heard as well. But, you know, with the miles per gallon, too, I think that's really common for everyone. We have towed our 40 foot fifth wheel with the 3500 dually and we were getting eight and a half miles of the gallon. And now we tow our little rig with our Jeep Gladiator and we're getting 
being eight and a half miles of the gallon. And so it seems like that is. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. It just seems like when you tow and you're, you know, in something large or you're towing something, I think that that's pretty average. And so, yeah, that's the only thing we're doing the same thing with our next rig. Are we getting a motor home? Are we going back to a fifth wheel? We're kind of doing all that investigation again, kind of starting over. And yeah, that's one of the things, but I'm really not hearing anyone say, this is what gets me the most gas mileage because really everybody complains about that. That is interesting. And I guess that's just the cost of what we're doing. And it's not like we're ready to give up because of the cost of, you know, what we're doing. We still love it. Right. Oh, definitely. It's so worth it. Then you just kind of factor in that cost with, you know, this kind of life. And like I said, we definitely agree that it's so worth it. And then I wanted to ask you, Chris, do you drive? Gary does 99% of the driving because I am very good at navigating and he's very good at driving and that's what works. Now, that being said, I've been behind the wheel a few times. I've done it not on the highway, but you know, when we're not on the highway, yes, I have driven a little bit. That's so cool. I'm asking because I have never driven. It was something that I for sure was going to do. Like I didn't even question. I was going to learn how to tow and all of that. And I just never did. Well, when we first started out, we were driving separate. I was driving a SUV towing my husband's motorcycle when we were traveling across the country doing physical therapy travel contracts. And so we needed two vehicles and all that. So I didn't want to drive, like switch and drive by myself, you know? So it'd be one thing if he were there, like helping me. And then with the small rig and the small, you know, Jeep Gladiator, I thought, oh, for sure, I'm going to do this. And then I still have it just because Randy likes to drive and he's really good at it. So I was just curious. I love seeing that, you know, women are brave enough to do it. And that's so cool that you were able to do it. That's awesome. Very good. And I want to, I, I would like to be able to drive more. It just seems to work that I'm the navigator and he's the driver and it works for us. The other thing to keep in mind is that in our state of residency, it, it is required that we have a a special license to drive something this big. And Gary had to, to get that license, he had to find somebody that had a CDL and give him lessons. He didn't actually need the lessons at the time, but he was supposed to have so many hours of driving with this other person in the vehicle and then had to take him to the test. So we were very lucky that we knew somebody that worked for the Department of Transportation who had a CDL. He was friends of ours and he accompanied Gary to the driving test. And he had to go out with a driving instructor uh, or with a, a tester and get this special rider on his driver's license. So he has a special driver's license to drive this. Now, that's not the case in most states. It just happened to be in our state. That is so interesting. I'm so glad you brought that up because I was not aware of that. What state is that? That's Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. So you kept your domicile state as Pennsylvania. I was not aware of that. Very interesting. Now, when he did the testing, was it in your motorhome? Yes. It was in the motorhome and he took the guy from the Department of Transportation. When he showed up at the testing site, they got into the motorhome and went out on the road just like they would if you were taking a driver's test. Wow. I did not know that that was something that Pennsylvania required. So I'm so glad you brought that up. That's very valuable information. Now, is it something that he has to keep testing on or is it just like your regular when you get your license, you just renew it? No, it, it's a one-time deal for this. It's not as involved as a CDL license, but in Pennsylvania, anything that's over 26,000 pounds, you have to have what's called a non-commercial class B license. Okay. So it's not the CDL. It's a non-commercial class B. Okay. Good to know. And that is on your driver's license. Yep. Oh, so good to know. That is pretty surprising. We're from Ohio. In fact, we're in Ohio right now, Northeast Ohio, but we lived in Florida for 20 years before we started traveling. And I did not know that about Pennsylvania. So very, very interesting. I'm glad we talked about that. Was it a long process? And do you kind of remember the cost of what that cost you to do that, Gary? The cost was very negligible. The length of time, I had to go get a learner's permit for it, and I drove with the learner's permit just like you would in a regular car, and then uh, when we were ready, I had my friend go with me to the testing site. Because he works for the state and is a CDL driver, he really explained to me the aspects of knowing everything about your rig and being able to explain that to the tester to give them the idea that you really knew what you were doing. 
Wow, that is so helpful. You really knew the right person. Yeah. That is wonderful. Yeah, we got lucky. I'm sure there's probably something online where people could maybe get a little bit of tips and, and lessons like that, maybe. You can hire a CDL trainer. So there are schools, lessons that you can do. I would say we got very lucky that we knew somebody that had a CDL that worked for the Department of Transportation and he had gone through this testing cycle before. He knew what to tell us, what to have Gary study and what to teach toward. So we just really kind of got lucky there. But there are places that you can pay for lessons if you have to. And not many states require this on the driver's license. And I would even say that there are probably a lot of people in Pennsylvania that are driving big rigs like this that don't have that. And nobody ever knows unless they get pulled over. So Right, right. That's why this is so good that we brought this up because a lot of people aren't aware, including me. Yeah, that's such a good information. Well, now I'd like to talk about, I know when people are thinking about this RV life, including when we were just, you know, thinking about it and doing the research and, you know, watching Instagram and YouTube and Pinterest and all of that, just walking through camping world, looking at all the different accessories and people would always tell us, you got to get this, you got to get that. And it can be really overwhelming, but I always like to find out from different RVers, what are three things that you would say are your favorite RV accessories or RV must-haves that you would recommend to somebody just starting out? I would say, that Gary and I probably have very different lists. So my top are more centered on the inside because that's where I spend most of my time. I love to cook. I love to have a sit down meal every night. And so, and we didn't have an oven here. So we went out and bought an air fryer convection oven combo because I like to cook regular meals. And that's very important to me. Also in the kitchen, I've got a Berkey water filter. And I love, love, love my Berkey. I drink a lot of water and I'm particular about the taste of the water. And we use that Berkey water filter and uh, it's always going. It's always got water in it and it's always filtered and ready for me. And then the last thing that I like is my rechargeable vacuum. We actually have a built-in vacuum in the motorhome that I have never used because I just prefer my little rechargeable vacuum with all my attachments. So I like my attachments and my rechargeable vacuum. Gary, on the other other hand he can tell you what his favorites are probably the most important one for me when we're setting up is i have what's called a level mate pro do you know what that is yes i've heard so many good things about it go ahead and talk more about it for our listeners yeah when i'm pulling into a campsite i activate this it's bluetooth onto my phone and it tells me when i'm level or how far off level i am so that i can shift you know i can back up a little bit bit more, pull forward a little bit, or turn to the left or turn to the right. And it tells me when I'm getting closer to being level, which makes life a lot easier. Oh, yeah. One of the other things I have is a TPMS, which is a tire pressure monitor. And that tells me the tires on the motorhome and the tires on the truck that we're pulling are safely inflated. If something were to happen, if I were to start losing tire pressure prior to a blowout or something like that, the TPMS would let me know that in advance. Yeah, very safe and important to have. We highly recommend everyone get a TPMS as well. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. And then one thing we got kind of extravagant on, because we like to do a lot of boondocking, we put in lithium batteries and 1,600 watts of solar on the roof. Oh, that sounds like a dream. (laughs) That's awesome. We love it. We boondocked in Quartzsite. I don't know if you've ever heard of Quartzsite, Arizona. Yes. Oh, yeah. We boondocked there. We were there for three weeks and we never had to run a generator because of the solar. Oh, my gosh. With your big rig, residential fridge, yep. you guys were there for three weeks without running a generator. Wow. Without running a generator, yes. I know. How many lithium batteries do you have? Lithium ion. They're battle born. And how many? Six. Six. Okay. Wow. And how much? Which, um, solar did you say again? 1600 watts. Wow, that's fantastic. Oh, that's like a dream of ours. 
Yeah. That's really good to know. Well, we really like it. We're glad we did it. Oh, yeah. That is money well spent because look at all the savings you just saved in three weeks of not having to spend any money on RV parks or whatever. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's only one of the places we boondock. We just do it because we love boondocking. That's our favorite kind of, of living is out where we don't see other people for a week. <laughs> and the solar and lithium batteries really help us do that. Yeah, that is actually our favorite way of camping too is boondocking. We were so afraid of it with our big rig. We did not have solar. We didn't have anything and we didn't know what we needed and if we could and you know what it means to boondock and all those things and we were just so afraid of it and then when we got the little rig that's why we got the little rig with solar and the solar runs the fridge and it's a 12 volt fridge and all of that and so we were like oh so excited to learn about boondocking and we love it. We need more solar we found out. We have a 200 amp hour lithium on battery, but we definitely need another one to do longer, but we still had to run the generator a little bit. But that is, yeah, our favorite too. I'm so glad to know what you have and how long it really allowed you to go without having to use a generator. That's it's huge. Yeah, it's been fantastic. And it goes back to the days again when I said we had a pop-up trailer and we'd go out into the National Forest with our daughters and we'd just stay out there for a week. We didn't have batteries then to do. We were really roughing it. So we wanted to get back to that, but that's hard to do when you have a 40-foot motor home. So we had to add the solar and the, the batteries on to be able to do that. But we love being able to do that now. Oh, that's so great. I'm so glad that you guys are able to do that comfortably with the dogs and everything, not have to worry. Yes. Oh, that is awesome. So now that you guys are loving full-time RV living, I always like to find out too, what was easier than you thought? Because so many people don't do this because they have these ideas that there's something that is, you know, either more difficult or or more expensive or scary or whatever. I just, you know, wanted to find out from you guys what's easier than you thought about this RV life. I would say that we were most afraid of the transition from living in our sticks and bricks home. We had a sticks and bricks for 25 years that we really loved and we thought it was going to be hard to downsize enough to fit in and to live comfortably with all of our stuff in a motorhome. And the transition from sticks and bricks living into tiny living went much, much better than I expected. I never missed any of my stuff that I get rid of. Selling the house was stressful, but we haven't regretted not having a house. We were afraid we would. So I would say over everything, that was the easiest thing that we thought where we thought there would be some difficulty. It turned out to be a lot easier than we expected. I agree. That was the same exact thing for us. We had a four bedroom home. We had a lot of stuff, a lot of conveniences, and it was so hard to get rid of all of that. Wondering if we were going to really, really regret it. And, you know, I would take pictures of things like sentimental things that I really didn't need to keep, but I really wanted to remember and so that was easier. Just at least I would know I'd have a picture to look back at. And that would give, you know, family member stuff that it was sentimental that I wanted, you know, them to have and not just, you know, donate. But I really, we both of us, Randy and I both say the same thing. We don't miss anything. We don't even remember the things that we got rid of. It's like, yeah, it's so surprising how comfortable that you could be living small. Exactly. Yeah. And I try to tell my family members now, I try to explain to them how much easier it is living small than it is acquiring all of those things and packing every corner of your house full of stuff. It's just amazing how much more simple and fun it is living in a smaller space. I agree. Yes. You know, we had so much stuff. It was ridiculous. And it feels so good to be without all of that baggage, really. <laughs> space is a premium in an RV. But I mean, obviously, with your big rig, you have a lot of storage. But it's so nice to not have it just cram packed with everything. And it's just nice to have what you need. And if you, know, you have extra room, if you need something else or you want to something else. It's great. I love that. That's a really good just surprise that you guys found that it, it's a lot easier than people think it is. So I wanted to continue just to talk about where you guys like to stay. We did talk about how you love boondocking and that's definitely with all your solar and batteries. I love that you're able to do that. And then do you guys enjoy staying at RV 
parks too? Or do you really prefer to stay boondocking off the grid if you can? Or how do you kind of plan your travels? When you're traveling around, where do you look first? And then how do you plan that? So we love a mix of all of those things. Our favorite way to be out and living is boondocking. We've already talked about that. We love boondocking. We find some fantastic places in the National Forest. In all of our travels, I think we tend to migrate back toward the National Forests. You know, we've been in deserts and beaches and the Midwest Great Plains, things like that. And I think we're always happiest in the National Forest. So we love boondocking in the National Forest. But uh, we can boondock very comfortably with our tank sizes and with our solar, our batteries for a couple of weeks, you know, and we've done three, three and a half weeks in the desert and in very woodsy national forests several times because that's what we like to do. So if we can boondock in a national forest, it's not just money savings for us. That's where we are happiest. That's where we're most comfortable. A lot of times we we don't have neighbors. You can't see your neighbors. We can just let the dogs go out and run and be dogs and do their thing. And that seems to be where all of us, us and the dogs together are happiest. But then when you finish up a couple weeks from boondocking, you know, we don't wash clothes and uh, things like that while we're out there. So then we like to go into RV parks for a few weeks. We are members of Thousand Trails because honestly, it would be hard for us to afford this lifestyle if we weren't. So we do find a lot of Thousand Trails parks that we can stay in since our membership is paid for, then it's basically free to go in. And so we'll spend a couple weeks in those campgrounds. We're not into resorts. I'll be honest with you. We don't do the amenities like uh, pools. We don't swim. We don't play games and bingo and all those things that, you know, when they talk about amenities in a park, we just aren't people that go in and use those amenities. Although I will say we've started playing pickleball. And so if I see a pickleball court, I'm probably going to go out and play a game. (laughs) But other than that, we don't really use their amenities, but we do go in and use their electricity, their water, the sewer. We can dump our tanks. We can do as much laundry as we want. We can take long showers because we have unlimited water, all those things that we don't have when we're boondocking. So we do like to get into the RV parks and spend some time there. The other thing about the RV parks is that we typically use them as a home base. I am curious about everything. I want to see everything there is to see. And I have a hard time being in a location without kind of exhausting all of the touristy kind of things. I want to know. And if there's nothing touristy about it, then I want to know how the locals live. I love to get out into the little towns. I love to get out into the woods, um, hiking on the mountains, things like that. So we don't need a resort to be happy. We don't need amenities to be happy. We use it as a home base and we get out of the park and we explore while we're in the area. We're kind of there to experience the area, not the park. Oh, we agree. Same thing for us. We want to use it as like a home base, like you said, and get out there and explore and find out all about the area. That's the whole point about RV life, right? I want to see the world. I want to see this country. You know, I want to see what's around. I don't want to be stuck in the park. So we get out of the park as much as we can. On that note, we also love state parks and COEs. The Corps of Engineer parks are something that I don't feel a lot of people use enough. They're very affordable and they don't have many amenities. I'll be honest with you. Usually we get electricity and sometimes water and we hardly ever get a sewer hookup and we're okay with that. Our tanks are big enough that we can stay in them for a couple of weeks comfortably without needing those hookups. And so they're more spacious typically. A lot of times we can't see our neighbors. And again, we really like that. So we love those state parks, the COEs. We have to be careful to make sure that they're big enough that we can fit in them. But for the most part, We almost always can fit in them, you know, into several of the spots that are there. Also, for travel nights, we are Harvest Host members. We don't usually stay in them for other than a travel night. If it's a two-day travel from point A to point B, then a lot of times I'll look for a Harvest Host that we just stay in overnight and then move on the next day. There have been a couple of times we found Harvest Hosts that'll let us stay a couple of nights so we can explore an area before moving on. So, like, we went through Chattanooga. We stayed there two nights in a harvest host because they would let us stay there and we could explore Chattanooga that 
the middle day and then move on the third day that we were there. So we like that. And then the last thing we do is mooch docking. So anytime we visit family, we make sure that they've got a big enough driveway for us to mooch dock in. And we love that. That's so good. We do the same thing. In fact, that's what we are doing right now, except we have full hookups where we are. We have a friend with 10 acres and he has full hookups for us. And it is so nice. That is like my favorite thing to do. I love mooch docking when you've got hookups. Yes, it's fantastic. <laughs> yes, we are so thankful for that. Yes, you are right. That's what we prefer as well. We're kind of the same way. We would love to be somewhere private and, you know, like boondocking where you don't really see your neighbors. But then there is so many positive things when you stay in an RV park and you can take long showers, do your laundry and, you know, just enjoy the amenities for a little while and then get back on the road and go somewhere else private. So yes. I think a little mix of everything is so good because then it makes you appreciate each one too. Yeah, exactly. You're right. You don't get tired of any one of those things because you can go out of any of those and come back into them when you're ready. That seems like a great place to wrap up part one and be sure to come back next week for part two. In the meantime, go follow Chris and Gary and their awesome dogs at Big Dog RV on Instagram and Facebook. I will have the links in our show notes as well as on our website at roaminyourhome.com slash Big Dog RV. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope to see you on the road. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Rome in Your Home podcast and YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love it if you would subscribe to our show and consider giving us a five-star review. It's free and would mean the world to us and help us grow. If you know anyone who would also enjoy this podcast, please share it with a friend. I would also love to connect with you on Instagram or Facebook at Rome in Your Home. Come back next week for another fun adventure, but until then, stay safe and we hope to see you on the road.